Would you believe me if I said that a single CPU core clocked at a measly 1.2 gigahertz is enough to process 10 gigabit traffic? And I'm not just talking about your basic forwarding here, uh, but also network address translation, PPPoE, VLANs, and even encryption and decryption. No? Well, then you'd be wrong. And in this video, I'm going to prove it. Okay, before I show you the setup, I think some context is in order. About a month ago, I published a video in which I demonstrated the ability of our CPU to handle 10 gigabit throughput, but that performance, unfortunately, came with a price. And I mean that in the most literal sense, because it was based on a commercial product called ASK or Application Solutions Kit. This software is sold by the makers of our CPU, so NXP, and the license for us to be able to distribute it costs anywhere between 40 and 60, $60,000 per year. Now, obviously, a lot of you were rightfully upset because of that, given that I've been preaching all along that how I love open source and will do everything in my power for our device once it is out, uh, to be as open as possible, and this ASK clearly violates that notion. Well, I have good news, but before I share it, I should first thank you for voicing your opinions, because I've sat down with one of the NXP senior field application engineers as a direct consequence of your input, and we've had a talk about, you know, their pricing, our vision and possible GPL violations that many of you have pointed out. I was very pleasantly surprised to learn that NXP is actually very mindful of the licensing when it comes to their software and they assured me that if we decided to move forward with the ASK then we'd be able to open source pretty much everything as far as the operating system is concerned so not only all the patches to the kernel, but also all the binaries they provide, in particular those that take care of the hardware offloading side of things. The only part we wouldn't be able to provide sources for, and we wouldn't get them either, is the microcode that runs directly on the CPU and acts as kind of a glue between hardware and software. This microcode is proprietary to NXP and doesn't work without their CPUs anyway, so I don't think that's really such a big of a problem. Now, with all that said, given my tendency, or should I say intent, to open source as much as I can, they actually suggested an alternative that is already fully open source, which means we wouldn't have to pay any license for, and that alternative is called DPDK, or Data Plane Development Kit. It's a very popular piece of software, particularly in data centers and high-end networking, but the complexity that it brings to the table kind of makes it not so appealing, I guess for most home users. You see, the main shtick of DPDK is the fact that it takes away all the network interfaces from the kernel and passes them on to the user space, meaning you pretty much lose everything that the kernel has been providing us for decades when it comes to networking, which means that yes, commands like IP route, IP tables, or even ping no longer work. Well, they do work, they just have no interfaces to work with. In fact, if you list the network interfaces once in the Linux command line, you simply won't see any, which means that all three layers in the OSI networking model that normally fall under kernel's responsibilities, so layer two, three, and four, are all up to us to, well, sort out. And it's here where DPDK comes in. It provides us with an environment in which we have direct access to the network interfaces in a way that's quite different from the traditional approach that kernel takes. You see, in Linux, the majority of software operates based on something called interrupts, which you can imagine as the software saying, hey, I need to do this to the main kernel thread. And once the kernel receives this message, it processes whatever the software in question asked it to do. And exactly the same approach applies to networking as well. So once the packet arrives into the CPU, it generates an interrupt, which then triggers the kernel to process said packet. And depending on how it needs to be processed, it can take quite a significant amount of resources and consequently time to process it. But DPDK, on the other hand, operates through something called pole mode driver, 
And as the name suggests, it turns the whole thing on its head, so to speak. As we no longer use kernel for packet processing, DPDK doesn't rely on interrupts, but rather uses polling of the network interfaces, which is to say it constantly keeps asking network interfaces whether they have any new packets to process. Just like my kids when they were younger kept asking, are we there yet? When me and my wife would drive them, well, anywhere. And yes, I know, DPDK doesn't really process packets because it's a layer 2 technology, so it operates on frames. I won't go into details about the difference between the two. Suffice it to say, in case you don't know, frames are a layer 2 construct, which means that the device that operates on them, such as a switch, look at their hardware addresses, most commonly referred to as MAC addresses. Frames, or should I say the information they carry, is only useful within a single network, which means that in order to cross into another network, we need a packet. And packets, among other things, carry the information we're most interested in, and that's the IP address of the source and IP address of the destination. And to process packets, which are represented by layer 3 in the OSI model, we need a router. Okay, now that we have all the nomenclature out of the way, let's talk about the drawbacks of DPDK, and that's the fact that it's more of a development baseline rather than a complete usable solution for the end user. I mean, it does provide all the necessary drivers for all kinds of things, such as direct access to network interfaces, any kind of custom features they have, such as hardware offloading in our case, and even direct access to memory should we need to go that deep. But what it doesn't provide, at least not out of the box, is any kind of layer 3 functionality, meaning that even with DPDK installed, we still can't see any network interfaces if we try to list them out in the Linux terminal. And here, dear viewer, is where the second half of the equation comes in, called VPP or Vector Packet Processing. VPP is a piece of software developed and open sourced by Cisco, and it's this piece of software in which we get back all the functionality that we lost by going the DPDK route. And not only do we get it back, we get a supercharged version. Because not only does it allow us to manipulate interfaces in a similar manner that we're used to from Linux, but it also comes with a bunch of stuff we normally have to ad uh, install additional software to get. Need PPPoE? Built in. Network address translation between IP6 and IP4? Built in. WireGuard, Internet Key Exchange, Load Balancing, DHCP, DNS, I could go on and on, but the point is, pretty much everything 99% of you out there need, VPP supports it out of the box. And because it uses DPDK as its foundation, and luckily for me, NXP already provides a branch of DPDK that supports hardware offloading, pairing the two was pretty much a non-issue. So where's the catch? Ah, I thought you'd never ask. Well, first, and for me personally, the most difficult part is definitely the mindset shift that I had to make because for the most part, your traditional kernel-based networking is something I'm quite used to. So I normally enter the vast majority of commands by using muscle memory. But that all stopped really with VPP because I had to learn pretty much all the commands from scratch. And here, I have to rant a little. You see, when it comes to the documentation of both DPDK and VPP, let's just say it's not the most user-friendly. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's a ton of documentation, but it's just so abstract that at points it felt like reading a completely different language. I guess what I want to say is that there's very little practical examples, even more so for any kind, you know, home lab use. So with zero prior experience, even doing the basic stuff like configuring interfaces took me a significant amount of time to get right. And since I'm ranting, let me also complain a bit about cross-compiling, which turned out to be a huge pain in the ass pretty much across the board. Dependency upon dependency upon dependency, each bringing their own way of building stuff to the table, and for each I had to figure out a way to properly set compiler flags, linkers, environment variables, you name it. I even wrote an article on our docs page, which I'll link to down below, 
And it's basically a step-by-step -step tutorial so that once our evaluation boards are out, you'll be able to easily follow it and be spared of all the horrors and frustration I had to endure in order to turn our reference design board into a fully functional router. Speaking of which, if you're interested in more frequent updates regarding the project and all the minor stuff that doesn't make it into my monthly report videos, I'm giving Blue Sky a chance because I decided to no longer use Twitter for the shit show it became in the recent years. I'll leave a link in the description to my Blue Sky account uh, that is not Twitter. And if you have any kind of questions or feedback about this project, well, give me a follow and ask away. Okay, action time. Like I said earlier, in order for DPDK and VPP to do their magic, we first need to A, hide our interface from the kernel and make them accessible from user space, and B, prevent Linux from using the course we want VPP to run its networking magic on. The first part, so passing on the interfaces to user space, is particular to our CPU and the instructions actually come with the documentation, which says that in order to achieve it, we need to pass a custom device tree to the kernel. In case you don't know, a device tree is a file that the kernel needs in order to know what devices are connected to the CPU and how. In your regular PC, this is not needed because UEFI or BIOS already does this behind the scenes, but in the embedded world, we don't have that luxury, so we have to write a device tree ourselves. Now, luckily for us, for our board that's currently in manufacturing, we don't need to start from scratch because NXP already provides plenty of examples, so we'll just use those and build upon them. But for the purposes of this video, the device tree that we're interested in is called USDPAA or User Space Data Path Acceleration Architecture. If you're new here, that might sound complicated, but it's actually not. DPAA is just a part of our CPU that takes care of networking and as the name of the device tree suggests, USDPAA variant just exposes this part to user space. This episode is brought to you by PCBWay. I've been working with them on my custom keyboard project and I was super impressed with their speed, quality and price, so I'm more than happy to recommend them to anyone who needs any kind of PCB manufacturing done, whether it's just for a couple of prototypes or if you need a larger production run. Link to their website of course, down in the description. Back to the video. We will, however, make a minor adjustment to the device tree we'll be using because I want to show you it's also possible to mix and match, meaning we can bypass only some of the interfaces while also being able to use the kernel networking stack on others. I'm going to delete this line here, which means that the kernel will be able to get online like you'd normally expect it to. And there's actually a very practical reason I'm doing this. You see, if for every change I do to the operating system that's running on our development board, I'd have to put the SD card into my development PC, flash it with the new image, then move the card to development board and reboot from it, well, let's just say it would get very annoying and time consuming very fast. So what I did instead is I set up a root file system on my development machine expose that root file system as a network file system mount and then I simply boot the development board with that file system mounted. And because kernel supports that out of the box and we need a fully booted operating system to even get to the DPDK part of things, this is the way to go. But before we get there, let's first boot our board and look at the kernel parameters that I'll use to boot it. The first two are irrelevant for the purposes of this video. Suffice it to say, they tell the kernel which device to output all the debug information to. The next three parameters, however, are where the magic happens. First, we tell the kernel to obtain an IP for the device we'll use as our NFS client via the DHCP server. Then we tell it to look at the NFS device for our root file system. And finally, we set all the details regarding where to look for our NFS so that it will be able to properly set the NFS device in the first place. As you can see here, my development PC is located at 10.0.0.90 and the NFS directory is located at slash mount slash rootfs. The next parameter, so RW, tells the kernel that the NFS mount is both readable and writable 
and root wait tells it to pause booting until the network file system is fully mounted and accessible. Which brings us to the remaining parameters that all optimize our system for DPDK and VPP to do their magic on. You see, by default, kernel accesses memory in 4 kilobyte chunks, also known as pages. This is very limiting for high bandwidths, but luckily for us, kernel also provides a way to increase the size of those pages, and that way is called huge pages. According to the documentation, the recommended page size for our use case is 2 megabytes, and since we want to dedicate 2 gigabytes to our networking cause, I've set the number of these huge pages to be 1024. Next, we also want to prevent the kernel to use the fourth core, well, for anything really, which is why we isolate it with the ISOL CPU's parameter, and furthermore, we convert it into a tickless core, meaning no interrupts will be sent to it, and as a consequence, it will be able to focus on nothing but networking. Uninterrupted, one might say. Okay, we're all set when it comes to parameters, so let's now download both, the kernel as well as the device tree we modified and built earlier. This is actually where the first two parameters we configured earlier come into play. If we didn't configure them, then we wouldn't see none of this. Now that we're in Linux, we don't actually have to test that the network interface we excluded earlier works, because if it didn't, then the system wouldn't be able to fully boot in the first place. But just to make sure, let's run IPA to find the single interface we've dedicated to the kernel, named FM1-MAC3. But what about the rest? Well, for that we have to run a sample DPDK application, aptly named Hello World, and while at it, Let's also pass it the core number that we want to run it on, which in our case is core 3. There you go, you see these 5 MAC addresses here? These are our network interfaces that we're passing on to user space and can now do with as we please. Let's now configure them with VPP. So what we're gonna do is start VPP and because it takes a couple of seconds, we're going to first look at the CPU utilization, which as you can see here, is now at 100% on core 3. Which means that yes, polling mode is now in effect and DPDK has started to poll our interface for incoming traffic. But even when the traffic does arrive, DPDK doesn't really know what to do with it yet. Because, well, we haven't configured anything yet. So let's now run VPP control, which will get us into VPP. Here, let's first list our interfaces to make sure they're all there. And as you can see, they're all down and have no IPs assigned to them. In my case, I have the Gigabit Ethernet 4 connected to my switch and I want this interface to become the WAN port. So what I'll do is I'll first turn it up and while I'm at it, also turn it into a DHCP client so that it gets an IP from my home router. If we quit the VPP configuration now and check Linux interfaces, you'll notice that absolutely nothing has changed. That's because the kernel still doesn't see the interfaces we're configuring in VPP and if we wanted it to, we'd need to set up a dedicated tunnel between the two, but that is out of scope for this video, so if you want to see how that looks, uh, let me know in the comments below and I'll make one just on that topic. Anyway, we configured one interface, but in order for our iPerf test to actually work, we need another. So let's go back to VPP and also assign a static IP to the interface called Gigabit Ethernet 3, which in my case is connected to a virtual machine that I'll run the iPerf client on. I'll give it an IP address that's on a separate network because I also want to show you that running NAT inside the VPP is not only possible, but it also makes absolutely no difference to the performance of the router. Okay, now that we have everything set up, we can finally start the test and for that, I'll show you three different windows. On first, we have our iPerf client that's running inside of a virtual machine on a development server and this virtual machine has access to a dedicated 10 gigabit NIC. Next, we have my Mac Studio that will serve as the iPerf server and we're doing it this way because the virtual machine I just mentioned needs to be the one initiating the connection since it's behind the net. And finally, we have the device under test, so our development board, and here's where I'll show you that indeed, no other cores are doing anything while the test is underway. You ready for a dose of awesomeness? 
And this is not even the best part. I purposefully lowered the clock of the CPU at some point while testing VPP. In fact, I went as low as 1.2 GHz and guess what? Exactly the same performance numbers that you see here. The only way that I could bring it down to its knees is if I limited the packet size, say from your standard 1500 bytes to half of that, so 750 bytes. But I don't personally see that as a big deal because I do consider myself a power user and yet I have never needed to limit the packet size in my home network. If anything, I increased it to nine kilobyte jumbo frames and I think 99% of my audience doesn't downsize either. So there's your answer. Regardless if at the end of the day we decide to go with the ASK or not, we will support DPDK and VPP out of the box and we already have some ideas on how to improve it even further. I won't share anything yet at this point because no final decision has been made, but once they are, of course, you'll learn about them right here. Tomasz from Slovenia, signing out.